Hallelujah. We're breaking up from Wednesday night talking about um, renewing our mind to the Word of God. And uh, we just got through talking about the parable of um, the sower where Jesus is talking about uh, the sower sowing the Word and, and um, so forth. And we uh, covered we covered how that um, the, the wisdom of this world in um, over in James chapter James chapter um, three is earthly, sensual, and devilish in verse fifteen, and um, and then so we talked about that and how that you know the, the the carnal mind is earthly, sensual, and devilish, and that the wisdom that's from above is peaceable, easy to be entreated, and so forth. Um, so Paul, Paul, in reference to the carnal mind, uh, or the the mind that's conformed to the world, is a carnal mind. Uh, we talked about how that Paul said he couldn't talk to the churches spiritual, but as in the carnal, even as in the babes in Christ. And then so that's we're getting ready to move over into why meditation of the word is so important. And that's where we're going to pick up right now. And let's look over in Luke chapter eight. I'm going to have to get better glasses or bigger print. Luke chapter, I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> my, my, my print on my notes are so small I can't even read it to tell which one it is. Luke chapter 6, that's what I thought. Verse 45, Jesus says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of an evil, evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Then in Proverbs 18, 21, we've heard this before, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And so we see the importance of what, what goes into us uh, governing what comes back out of us, really. And we, we've heard the old computer um, um, jargon, I forget what you call it, acronym or whatever. Computer acronym G I G O garbage in garbage out, uh, and that was that simply meant this. You know, people say them dumb computers. Well, what the dumb computer is the not so intelligent operator or person who puts. I was gonna call them dumb operators, but I hate to do that. It's not kind. Um, so the the not so intelligent operators who put the wrong stuff in, and uh, I tell you, you can skew data in a computer in a heartbeat, mess up all kinds of stuff, and if you're using um, if you're using a computer to, for your baselines and that kind of stuff, the data that's in it, if it's bad data in it, it'll ruin uh, your, your analysis and everything. And so you got to have the right information going in to get the right, right understanding and the right uh, interpretation and everything else back out of it. All right. Um, I've, I've told this story before, but I worked one year at, with Burroughs Welcome in their their uh, lab there in Greenville. Um, and what they were doing, they were transferring computer systems, and they couldn't transfer the data. You know, you got to understand, back in these days, you know, stuff was so proprietary, you just didn't have real easy ways, so you, you had to re-enter it. And uh, they had years of data. I mean, we're talking stacks of 132-column rainbow print, rainbow paper, full of data from years and years and years of putting drugs in an incubator and putting them in there for 10 years and see how much it broke down and putting it in a freezer for 10 years to see how much it broke down and just studies on, on the life longevity of the drugs and stuff. And um, we were supposed to take all that data and re-enter it and then we had to print it and compare it to make sure that it was, had been moved correctly. Well, we found out one of, the, one of the people we were working with was just sitting there. You were saying, does it say such, 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 such? And they go, yep. And uh, one of us got really smart and said they're not doing their job, which the person who got really smart was me, and started feeding them false data just to see what they would say. And they said, yeah. And so I started making notes. They're not doing so. And the reason it was so important was all their data would have been messed up had they not had the right data back in. It would have skewed everything they, they studied and their analysis of it. If you put the wrong word in, if you don't put the right things in you, you're going to get into a situation in life where you're going to need the right analysis of God's Word and you're not going to get it. Now, if you listen to Grandma, you know the, uh, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Amen. And cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, that, that, that's bad data going in. And then in an hour of trouble and tribulation, when you need the right analysis of the Word of God, you don't have anything to pull out except, you know, the book of first opinions. Hello? Yeah, okay. Now, I know I got out here late. That was a, that was a clock mess up, but y'all hook up with me now. 
All right? Praise the Lord. So, death and life, what goes in? You know, out of good treasure, out of, uh, good man out of the good treasure, bringing forth good things. Um, when we're born again, our nature changes. However, uh, we have spent, you spent your whole life up, to the t up until the time you got born again learning things according to the former nature and its dictates, really, the course of this world. You've got to undo that. You know, when you get born again, uh, you're supposed to start thinking different. Well, you've been taught to think, you know, even Christians. I mean, you know, you know, you could be raised by Christian parents. A lot of times the old, old people were, were bad. You know, they, they, uh, I grew up in a church where, boy, they wore be burlap sacks and tied the hair up and beehive hairdos and didn't wear makeup. Boy, they could gossip down the best of them. I mean, they, like one preacher said they could sit in the living room and lick a spoon in the kitchen because they could gossip so good, <laughs> you know? But they were holy, you know? And, uh, but you've got to change the way you think. And even Christians get negative and get uh, worldly thinking and get carnal thinking and, and worry and don't, don't go do things according to the Word of God. So uh, we must learn that what happened to us, what, what we must learn what happened to us, that is the new birth, and what we have become. In other words, we were, trans, we were, we were transformed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look over there. Okay, now, Nathan's singing through the wall. We'll just have to kind of ignore that. Although it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I remember one time we were in Charlotte. And um, uh, Pastor Hagen was doing a meeting down there. And on the other side of the wall, second chapter of Acts was doing a concert. <laughs> you know, and they were, they were cranking it up pretty loud. You could, you could hear them almost over the in speakers and on the side where we were sitting where actually Brother Hagen and Pastor Hagen had, had come together. And so you could hear second chapter Acts about almost as good as you could hear them in the meeting. It was, it was pretty funny. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 5, this is 1981, uh, chapter se verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, see, the Bible tells us that, but this, but a lot of people don't get it. Are you here? All things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, or better stated in modern English, to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word, word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I did leave out the words to be. They're italicized. They're not in the original Greek, so I like to read it that way. If they're not there, they were put there by the translators. I am thoroughly within my uh, proper reading rights to leave them out because they're not in the original Greek. And they were added by the translators because they thought it would help. Well, that's their opinion, and I just decided to leave them out, all right? So if anybody wants to write me some Mickey Mouse letter, don't bother. Hallelujah. <laughs> you never know what people are going to do, do you? All right. Here we understand that we become new creatures in Christ. Only through our knowledge of the effects of the new birth and practicing its application to our lives will we benefit from it in this realm. Understand, you, you know, you're born again, you get to go to heaven, but you want not only the, the new birth to affect the fact that you're going to heaven, you want it to affect your daily life here. Yes or no? All right, thank you. I got an amen from Brother Bill. We do want it to affect our daily life here. We want, as Deuteronomy says, to experience days of heaven on earth. We want to live uh, the, uh, the victorious, abundant life here. Amen? Isn't that right? We want, we want life to be good. Well, we want to experience what he happened to us in the new birth. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We want to live from that. So in order to, uh, to not live according to this world, to the course of this world, not live carnal, not live earthly, sensual, devilish. And as we talk about the earthly, central, devilish mind, it doesn't mean it's intrinsically evil in the sense that you're some kind of weird serial killer cutting people up in little parts, that kind of thing. But your thinking is contrary to the Word of God. Anything that's contrary to the Word of God is earthly, central, and devilish. All right? Even if it's not uh, manifestly uh, perverse evil, it's still earthly, sensual, devilish. 
It challenges the Word of God. Satan didn't come to Eve in the Garden of Eden with some kind of uh, horrid, you know, horrible, you know, statement uh, and, and, and try to do e get her to do evil. He just said, have God said, eat the fruit. See, but that was earthly, sensual, and devilish. It appealed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. And so we want to learn how to live from a different place. And the, the, the first thing the believer needs to start learning how to do is to live from their spirit and not their, what we refer to the old man, the carnal nature, the flesh. Amen. You know, Paul writes, makes, makes an interesting statement. He said, put off the old man and put on the new man. And he's talking to Christians. So he's not talking about getting born again again. He's talking about putting off the, the, uh, the carnality. He's talking about not being conformed to the world. He's talking about not being earthly, sensual, and devilish, and putting on the things that are righteousness, the things that are godly, uh, putting on those activities and those actions that reflect the inner work that's already taken place. And that's something we have to do. And we do that by coming to a knowledge of, number one, first of all, who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. Now, uh, one, of the, one book needs to be in your library that you can, probably carry, you can carry around in your pocket all the time. And it's a little mini book that Kenneth E. Hagin wrote um, and, and put together called In Him. And it goes, you know, it's a, and we, we're talking about mini book, you know, like, like 30 pages or whatever that are little bitty pages. But he, he just does a little teaching in there, but then he lists all the scriptures in the entire New Testament and categorizes them by in him, in whom, in whose and those kind of things, and the list of scriptures, you can look them up. And there's over 150 of those. And uh, just the reference, just the consolidation, and, and the, the uh, bringing all that together in one source is great, because it tells you who you are, what you have in Christ. See, this is part of the power of that renewing of the mind. Remember, we first started out with this whole teaching on Romans 12, 2, where it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind metamorpho greek metamorphosis english by the don't be conformed don't be shaped don't be fashioned don't be molded according to the world but be have a metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind go from being a caterpillar uh, to a butterfly, from a tadpole to a bullfrog. Perhaps most people want to pick up. You know, um, Barry McGuire did that song back years ago called Bullfrogs and Butterflies Have Both Been Born Again. And really, it was a cute song, a catchy song, and you know, you can sing in a concert and have fun with it, but it's inaccurate. Because you see, the believer doesn't have a metamorphosis. He's born again. In his spirit, he doesn't have metamorphosis. But in his soul, he has to have a metamorphosis. That's not the new birth. That is the renewing of the mind. Okay? And, I, and listen, I'm not, I'm not condemning or criticizing. It's a, it's a cute song. I love it. I used to sing it. Bullfrogs and butterflies. We've both been born again. Do, 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 do. The guy sang bullfrogs. The girl sang butterflies. Okay? You get it? All right? Because girls are always cute and fluttery, and guys are like, ribbit, ribbit. Anyway. Brother Bill, you remember the song, don't you? Do. You do? All right. Anybody else ever heard it? All right. Lloyd's heard it. My goodness. Belinda's heard it. Huh? <laughs> old people. The old people, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Belinda took offense. I think she stood up. <laughs> I haven't picked, I, I, she's getting short jokes these days for me. I, I better behave myself. <laughs> yeah, I think she stood up, or hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, you, you know, we're not bullfrogs and butterflies and bo born again in the sense that we're metamorphosis. The metamorphosis doesn't take place in the new birth. You're just born again. That's, more, that's a new birth. You're born anew, afresh. The metamorphosis takes place in the soul, in your thinking. And that's where you have to, your mind is renewed and, 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 and you, through the Word of God, and you have a metamorphosis there. So it's not your spirit. Your spirit does not have a metamorphosis. You don't have, when the new birth is not the metamorpho, okay? The new birth is a, is a complete, radical, instant change of your spirit. You're born, you're, you're, you're born out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Your spirit is born again. Your soul, however, has to be transformed or go through a metamorpho. It has to experience going from the tadpole to bullfrog, the but, uh, caterpillar to butterfly stage, by, and it tells you, by the renewing of your mind, Paul says. By the renewing of your mind. By letting the Word of God. James says it this way. He said, receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God, which is able to say what? 
your soul. He didn't say your, he didn't say your spirit. He said your soul. He said your suke. Be, you know, receive with me as the engrafted word of God, which is able to save, restore, make whole, make sound your suke. See, the word save has different meanings other than getting born again. Okay, it, 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 the Greek word sozo carries, carries broader, a broader spectrum of meaning, and we limit it to being born again a lot of times in our thinking. Now, I don't think necessarily think people preach it that way, which is because we use the word so much and use it without ever explaining it. Uh, people kind of take on that mindset that, you know, sa say being saved or salvation is the new birth. Well, that is one aspect of that word sozo, but it also is to restore. And so, you know, the, the interesting thing the psalmist said was, he restoreth my soul. See, your spirit doesn't get restored. Your spirit gets born again. The soul has to go through that transformation so it thinks the way God would think. Now, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Say it, though. That's true. But when you have a metamorphosis, you transform from the carnal mind to the mind of Christ. And so that it, it functions and thinks in realm with spiritual things the way God does. That's, that is the transformation you're looking for. To go from a carnal, sensual, earthly, devilish mind to a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. And that takes place by the renewing of the mind, or the renewing of the soul, okay? So that, that's all that process, that metamorphosis, that transformation. And so, uh, finding out who we are in Christ is the first thing. Because you can't think of yourself differently until you know what the Bible says about yourself being different. You can't, you can't know that your spirit is alive unto God and delivered out of the kingdom of darkness until you see what the Word of God says about it. That's why God gave the revelation to Paul that he gave to Paul. Think about that. Paul says, I knew a man above 13, 13, 14 years ago, such a one was taken up into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Remember that? And heard, heard things unlawful to be uttered. Y'all remember that? And then he goes on, he, he, twice that passage, I think he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Now, most scholars will look back at it and believe that when he was stoned and left for dead, he died. Went into heaven, and then he saw, he, he was given the revelation of the new birth, of his application to the body of Christ, and then was sent back and was raised up from the dead. You know what I mean? Let's about, listen, you're talking about professional stoners. These people know how to stone people to death. They knew how to kill somebody. All right? To, ex to exact their guilt on somebody else. And uh, then Paul got up and went into the city. <laughs> but he said it was unlawful. To, he, he couldn't even utter the things. So what did he do? It took him the rest of his life through, through what he saw in Revelation and, and going into heaven, called him to the third heaven, and by the Holy Ghost to write those things out and bring that revelation out through his writings. It took him all that time, the rest of his life, to write in his epistles and to bit by bit release that revelation in, in, a, in a written form that was structured in a way the body of Christ could take it. I don't think, if you come back and say, man, I just saw heaven, I saw what we are, it'll flip some people out. But God knows what he's doing. He let him, he let him over time write all these letters to the churches. And in that, and here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, man, if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creature. See, he saw those new creatures when he went to heaven. He saw the new birth when he went to heaven. He saw what, took, what, what happened to man. He was transformed out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Something happened to that man. Amen. He saw that. And so, over time, over time he begins to teach us that we, we, we're new creatures in Christ. Old things passed away, all things became new. Well, it can't be talking about your soul. You still knew who you were when you got saved. Can't be talking about your body. You just went home, and I guarantee you, you weighed the same thing or maybe more, because you probably would not eat at the church that you did before you got saved. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, you don't get a new body when you get born again. Oh, dear Lord, boy, we, we could make some money. We could advertise, come to faith and victory church and get saved, you'll lose 150 pounds a night. And we'd have them lined up out in the street with me, Brother Bill. <laughs> They'd be lined up coming in. I mean, we just we receive your offer now. Go ahead and give it. When you get down there and get saved, you'll be a whole new. Boy, but that's not what happens. That's not what happens. The spirit of man. Jesus told Nicodemus, except the man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. Over in, over in John's gospel, the third chapter. Remember that? Amen. He said, except the man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. He, how can I be born when he's old? Can I enter the second time into my mother's womb? And Jesus said, now you're a teacher in Israel. You don't know these things? And we don't explain that, that there are spiritual things and there are natural things. And the spirit has to be saved. 
That was his teaching on the new birth. The spirit of man has to be saved. The, 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 the natural man doesn't get born again. As a matter of fact, Ephesians makes it clear that your body gets a promissory note. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. Not talking about the day of redemption for your spirit, the day of redemption for your body. When, when, when he, where he wrote to the church of Thessalonica and said, and that, that there's, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of the archangel of God. Amen? And that the, the corruptible shall put on the incorruption and his mortal shall put on the immortality. We will change in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. But we will not prevent them which are asleep. For the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen? I'm kind of back. I got it backwards. Really. That's okay. You get the point. Amen? So the day of redemption is not the spirit. Your spirit's saved. Paul said to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. But that's not full redemption. Well, I beg you if we're going to be with the Lord's foot. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. We long to be clothed with that glorified body. The saints in heaven, just like the New Testament saints could not be made, the, the Old Testament saints could not be made perfect without us, those who have preceded us in death cannot be, be made perfect until the whole church goes up with the glorified, resurrected, immortal bodies. Hallelujah. So we have a seal of redemption. So we have the promissory story note of a redeemed body. Now, now I, you know, healing and all these different things are things so that you can live a victorious life in that body, but it's a, still a carnal death doing by It's a mortal body. Should the Lord tarry long enough, you will physically die. There's, the, the, the people who say that people teach faith, teach that you're not going to die, are just lying. Well, if you can't get sick, how are you going to die? Just like the Old Testament saints who knew God, where they walked with God and were not. <laughs> Amen? Call all the kids in, line them up, lay hands on them, bless them or curse them, depending on how they live, and th lean on your staff, kick up your feet, and go home. That's how they die. They die, you know, they die in faith. You don't have to be sick to die. My God, you can just wear out. <laughs> Nathan asked me today, how did Ronald Reagan die? I said, he just died. He got he, old age. He's up in his 90s. Now, I don't know if he's uh, 90, 91. I forgot exactly how Ronald Reagan was when he passed away, but 90 plus. Just old age? Just wore out? That mean he will mean he got to be sick? Don't have to have an accident. Don't have to be beheaded or something. You, don't, you can just die of old age. Just decide. And, and usually old folk decide when they're going to die, too. Now, uh, um, we had somebody that was, that was here one time, and uh, they sat in my office when they said, Pastor, I just want to die. I want to go home. And we, talk, we did everything we could to talk them out of that. They just didn't want to change their mind. Gave them options. Why don't you go do this? Why don't you get involved in this? Do something to ha have purpose. I just, I just want to go. You know, their husband had passed away. They, they didn't want to live by themselves. They, they, they were ready to go home. If you can't talk people out of that. You ain't going to talk them out of dying. So finally they moved back where they came from and it won't much longer than that, they died. About six months later, they, they died. Well, how can you, you can't get upset about that. You can't say the Lord wouldn't heal them, the Lord wouldn't do this. They wanted to go home. They sat in my office and told me that's what they wanted to do. Did everything I could to talk them out of it. But if people want to die, well, they got what they wanted. I said they got what they wanted. They got to go home. Hello? Y'all hear you gone home. I said, y'all hear you gone home. You see? We, 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 we get this idea that somehow or another we got the power not to ever die. That's not biblical. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Paul said, I'm in a strip between two. Whether to depart and be with the Lord. I love this over in Philippians. Whether to depart and be with the Lord or remain with you, which is more needful for you. And since it's more needful for you, I'm staying. Now, I paraphrase that a big time, but you go read it. That's what he said. Now, I'm ready to go, but you need me. Now, I could leave, <clears throat> but since you need me, I'm staying. And then later on, he wrote back and said, well, I, <coughs> I finished my course. I kept the faith. There's laid up for me a crown of joy. I'm out of here. And then he went. Hello? They couldn't kill him until he said it was time to kill him. 
Amen. Now, how did you get off of that? Well, the body is not redeemed. We have covenant of health. We have covenant of longevity, long life. Amen. But that's what the Lord said over in, in um, I, I don't know why I'm over here, but it, you got, we have to understand the difference. See, your body didn't get redeemed when you got saved. It came under a covenant of promises concerning long life, concerning uh, health, concerning different things, but it did not get redeemed at that time. You have a seal. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I don't have a 666 in my forehead. I got Holy Ghost in my forehead. Amen. Now, that's figurative. I'm not necessarily, don't go ahead. And, that's a cult over there. They think you got Holy Ghost written in your head. Oh, oh there's just people out there who just kind of irritate you. They, they, they rejoice with that Hagen died. Said, oh, Kenneth Hagen didn't have enough faith. He never said he wasn't going to die. My, 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 Kenneth Hagen didn't have enough faith. You're evil. You rejoicing that people die, you're evil. And I don't mean rejoicing with them they got to go home. You're rejoicing they die because you hate them so bad. You're evil. You're not of God. Yeah. Well, I'm born. No, you I don't think so. Yeah. People like that don't have the spirit of Christ in them. So you better go get saved. You can't be that, you can't be that excited that somebody who's, that you disagree with doctrinally died. That's not godly. You know, and then it brings out things where you make other people want to cuss or hurt you. You know, you're thinking, man, if I could get through the internet and find you, I'd choke you. You know, but that's not godly, so I had to repent. Hallelujah. <laughs> but if I, he's like, if I could have gotten my hands on them right then, I'd have hurt them. You know, I would have laid hands on them. Suddenly. Yeah. Amen. Now, I'm being a little facetious now. Just a little. <laughs> Understanding that Paul wrote in, in 2 Corinthians that if any, man's, uh, new, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. His spirit's born again. Jesus made it clear that it's talking about your spirit. Paul made it even clear that it's talking about your spirit. All things are of God. Amen? But he goes on and tells us you're sealed by the spirit of promise. Your, your, your body's not saved. Then he tells us in Romans you've got to renew your mind. James tells us you've got to save your soul. Paul's talking about renewing the mind. Are you here? We're, we're to receive with me the same graft we're able to save our soul. So the body has a promise. So, but here's what you're going to do with your body until Jesus comes back. Keep it under. Keep it healthy. Keep it healed. Keep it in good shape. But you're going to buffet it and keep it. Paul said, I buffet my body daily. You're going to have to deal with that rascal when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you get up in the middle of the night, and when you walk around in the middle of the day. You're going to just have to keep it under. I don't want to have to do that. I thought I was saved. Yeah, you could be born again and still got to do it. Paul, think about what he wrote. Think about he was called up in the third heaven. Think about the things that he saw, and he still said, I buffet my body daily. I mean, it would be great if he said weekly. Wouldn't it? Monthly. Every four or five years, he said, I got to deal with this thing every day. You can go ahead and raise your hand on this one. How many have to understand that? <laughs> you know, I mean, some of y'all, some of y'all I know, you probably have to deal with it hourly. I buffet my body hourly. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some things want to come up out of your mouth, don't they? I ain't going to look out there. There are people I know. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you've got to deal with your body. Your spirit's born again. Your body is kept under with a promise. But then what, the, so the, if you look at the scriptures, the body tells you not to yield your members, to buffet it, to, to, to discipline it. Amen. Paul talks about he disciplines his body like a boxer. You've got to keep, so here's scripture. You're born again, your spirit's born again. You have to desire sincere milk, then it'll grow thereby. Your spirit grows up. Your body, you keep it under. But the soul, you're told to renew for it to have a transformation. Why? Because it is the governor that determines. I'm to write this one down. It is the governor that determines what realm you live from. Whether you live out of the spirit or you live out of the flesh. And Paul made it very clear. Be not conformed to this world. Romans 12, 2 again. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
He didn't say go get born again to be, break the world conformity. He said have a mind renewal. Well, what, what's he talking about, preacher? He's talking about the fact that although you're born again and your spirit's alive unto God, there is, no, there is no governing effect in your life until you renew your mind to the Word of God that will allow you to break out of acting like you used to act before you got saved. Now, I remember a <laughs> funny thing. My, uh, my pastor out of Greenville, uh, John Zabowski, we, we, we came out of that church in Greenville, and they're just wonderful, wonderful people. We love them think the world of them. They, they love God. And um, we thank God for the place we had and the time we had there when we first got saved and, and came into the kingdom and, and, and were trained in ministry to, to serve and to work and to be a, you know, be a part of that. But uh, his testimony, now, now he was so messed up. Um, he had hepatitis and he was, yellow, he was so yellow from using dirty needles. He was a heroin addict. Um, that they used to call him Chiquita. Because he shot up so bad, he had hepatitis. He was yellow. His nickname was Chiquita, and uh, he got born again and got delivered from drugs. Praise the Lord! Now he, he wasn't yellow because it was his natural skin color. He's Polish. And yeah, we used to do all the Polish things. And we used to give him coffee mugs with a handle on the inside and all that kind of stuff. Tell Polak jokes all the time. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, people couldn't pronounce his name. You go to that church where that, uh, that Zambalanski is or that Zambaluski or, you know, I mean, they called him all kinds of, Zab Zambalanski or, I mean, uh, 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 Zabowski. You know, they just couldn't get it. Well, he got saved, turned on to the Lord and everything, and then found out the guy, people told him, says, your brother, your brother Dave, he's demon-possessed. <laughs> yeah, he's demon-possessed. He's got devils. Well, Dave got saved and um, showed up at the house with a six-pack and threw the door open and said, I got saved, let's celebrate. <laughs> All right, if he got saved, he wouldn't have done that. So he said, wait, 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 no, no. There's, just because your spirit doesn't get born again, don't mean your mind's fixed. Especially if you know, if you didn't grow up in church and you came up and you came up in certain neighborhoods and stuff, you don't know anything. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably go, "Oh, you can't do that. You know better than that." Well, yeah, I'm mean, usually that means that. But I've, I've seen people, I've seen people smoking after they got saved. You can't go and say if you really got anything, you would have stopped smoking. No, they got to renew their mind. They got to break that world conformity. Amen. I don't, I, I'm not, I don't believe that, you know, well, if they got anything, they'll be back. If they got anything, they'll, they'll, they'll they're, they're, they won't, if they, oh, they did that, they couldn't have gotten saved because they wouldn't be doing that. They got saved. No, you know, if you renew your mind, you find out there's certain things you sh shouldn't be doing, you'll stop doing them. I know there's a witness of the Spirit, but see, people can be so babe, so much babe, and so baby, uh, not so much babe, boy, I got my tongue tied, can be so carnal and so, uh, uh, so, so whatever, that they just, that, 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 that the moral code in them ain't working right. And they get saved, and all of a sudden, now they got all this conflicting stuff. Well, how do you help them? You don't help them by telling them they're going to go to hell if they smoke that cigarette. You help them. You know, gonna say, you need to stop doing that. This is wrong. You can bring them in and say, look, this is wrong, but here's how I'm going to help you. You shouldn't be doing that, but here's, you just need to start meditating on what the Word of God says about you. You're a new creature. See, the new creature doesn't do that. The Bible tells you not to yield your members, your body, as a servant of unrighteousness. So, so when, you act, when you engage in this kind of activity, you're yielding it. You're violent. And start teaching them so that they can understand what the Word of God says and renew the mind that I shouldn't be doing this. Amen. And you've got, you got to give people some room. Now, if they're 15 years down the road, they had not done it yet, they, they haven't done any growing or five years or whatever. But you can't go one week later and say, if you did this, you're going to hell. My goodness. You gotta, they got to have time to grow and to renew their mind and have, have a trans break the world conformity. I mean, what happens if you go home and your whole house smokes? You've been smoking since you were 12 because that's what your mom and your daddy gave you your first pack when you were 12. Because it made you a man. And signed the smoking, you remember, some of you remember this, the smoking permits for the school. Anybody remember that? You could get a smoking permit when you went to school, and, and if you had that, you could smoke, and the school couldn't do anything about it. You go outside, and listen, right at the back of our school, Aiden Griffin High School, down there in Littlefield, North Carolina. How big is Littlefield? About that big. Because there is a <laughs> there's a sign over here that says Littlefield, and on the back side of the sign it says Littlefield, and if and, and you can't even stand in Littlefield without standing outside of it. All right, it's not a town. It's just a you know they have those little uh, I don't even know what they call them. You know, but basically it's just a little area. This is to delineate where it is. So it's out there at Littlefield. 
that's the side road that runs down off of Highway 11. But on the back side of the school, you go out there, they all out there smoking. The principal walk out and say, I want to see your smoking permit. And they have smoking permits. And as long as they had that, they could smoke. And parents would, would sign those things. And sometimes the kids would forge the parent's signature. <laughs> you know? But if they had that, they could sit there and smoke. So, you know, if you're living in that, you just get saved and everybody smokes, and you go, and you go home and smoke, you're not going to hell. But you start looking in the Bible and talks about your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost, and you start saying, oh, man, that's wrong. You, you see, the Word of God begins to renew your mind. You begin to break out of world conformity. Transformations start to take place. So you get saved instantly, but you've got to grow. The body is kept under, but the soul has to be transformed in how it thinks, where it gets its information from, how it dissects that information and applies it to life. That is the metamorphosis. It, you have to go from a mind that thinks earthly, sensual, and devilish to a mind that is that's peaceable and easy to be entreated. You know, the, the peace, the, the wisdom that comes from above. Amen? <clears throat> so that you think like God would think. How would the Lord handle this? I had somebody come to me a number of years ago. And uh, somebody was trying to get them to put in these, uh, these vending machines. They were getting into this vending machine thing, which is fine if you're selling soft drinks or candy bars, but the cigarette side. And they came to me and they wanted to know, Pastor Ed, what do you think about, you know, I mean, so it was another person in the church was trying to get them into it. And, um, and uh, what do you think about me doing these vending machines? Well, I said, well, you know, let me ask you a question. Real good question said, because um, they were going to stack them with cigarettes, you know, and so forth. And, of course, the, the argument had been, you know, look, you know, somebody's going to get the money. The church may as well get the money. You don't have to have unjust gain to bless the kingdom. If that's the way it is, then why don't you just go out and start selling dope, selling drugs, and then taking the profits and bring it to the church, the tithe on your profits and bring it to the church. Hello? Nobody's answered. I mean, seriously. So I said, I'll tell you what. You go ahead and do it. Because, you know, I knew that if I told them not to do it, and, and they got in a financial title or whatever, they, they get mad at me and say, well, you told me not to do this, and I could have made some money out of that. No, 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 no. We're not going down that road. I said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go ahead and get, get these vending machines set up, and get those cartons of cigarettes out and set them down. Now, before you put them in the machine, lay your hands on them and say, Now, Lord, I sell these to the glory of God. I thank you that, you know, that I'm blessed by selling these things and, and that can give people cancer or whatever. And just go, ahead, go ahead and say, Lord, I do this for the glory of God. <laughs> they come back and see me. They didn't even bother. They didn't even get to the vending machine part. They came back about two days later and said, Pastor Ed, I can't do it. Why not? He said, I got to think about what you said. There's no way I could put them cigarettes in that machine and in any way justify saying, I do this for the glory of God. Now, what did you base that on? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. Yeah. So there's a scripture. Amen? That's what I base that on. You know? If it, I'm sorry, Brother Bill. <laughs> See, we got to get some different lights back here so I can get back to the front row. Now that he's got, I can't get to the front row anymore. It messes up the camera. So I go into, I go into a Darth Vader mode. I get dark. Lord Vader. Anyway. Um, so whatever we do in order to do it all for the glory of God. How in the world, that's, you know, they, they, they found that real quick. They couldn't stock them cigarette machines. They couldn't do it and say, I'm doing it for the glory of God. Amen. What happened there? See, when that scripture was applied, there was a renewing of the mind in that aspect. That if I'm going to do something, that whatever I do, and whether I say it or whether I do it, has to be for his glory. And then now, that renewing has taken place in their thinking. They're experiencing a transformation because now they begin to judge their actions or words based on, does it glorify the Lord? That's how you break out of world conformity. Before that, there was a lot of analyzation. Well, you know, the church is going to get blessed because you're going to make money and tithe on it. That, so that's human reasoning. The Bible doesn't say do whatever you want to do so that you can bless the church. It says whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. 
Are you here? Now, there's some pinhead out there right now who thinks they know so much of the Bible. They're going, well, bless the church is to the glory of God. Not if you got, well, why don't you just go kill some folks and steal the money? And then bring it to the church. That's just pinhead thinking. I love you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know me. I don't pull any punches. Joe, we kind of got the memo going on here. The orange colored shirt. All right. I like, I like people who get in on the memo. Y'all missed it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so <laughs> it running out of time, but I was late. <laughs> so think about that. Born again spirit. Promise, Sarah, note on the body, but the, necess necess uh, the requirement to renew the mind. And in that particular case, by giving them one scripture and telling them what to do with it and how to try to apply it, they had in that arena, now listen, you understand this, mind renewal was going on all the time in different arenas. It didn't happen all at once. You're going to have this vein that you're renewing your mind, this vein you're further down, you're further back, and you're going to be up, you're going to be all over the place as far as where you are on the path to mind renewal in different areas. In different subjects, in different issues. But as you feed on the Word of God in those arenas, there is a mind renewal taking place along those lines. There is a transformation. You're breaking the world's conformity or the world's fastening of that line of thinking by renewing it to the Word of God. Hello? Now, I know we're in election season. I don't understand. I, I mean, listen, if, and if, you, if, you're, if you're here, I'm not, I'm not mad with you. I don't understand how any Christian can vote for somebody who's pro-homosexual and pro-abortion. I don't understand it. I don't care about the economy. God's my source, not the United States government. You understand what I'm saying? Now, listen, I, I, as a citizen, I care about the economy, but I don't vote. Listen, if, if, if the person I was voting for, I agree with economically, but I was totally socially opposed to everything they believed, I can't vote for them. If they're pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, marriage, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff, I can't vote for that. I don't care what they're... Why? I knew thee before thou, uh, I formed thee in my, thy mother's womb. And I don't, and I don't need the films to know that when that life is created in the womb, it's life. Then I got the Bible. Hello? Or, you know, either a party or a candidate, or, you know, a party's platform. I can't, I cannot in good conscience, I, even if it would hurt me financially, I wouldn't be able to vote for that in good conscience. What are going to happen if both parties or all three parties, every party is pro-abortion, pro-homosexual marriage? Go in there and put a blank. Hello. Well, that's a protest vote. What else can I do? I can't vote for it. Amen. I'm going, to, I'm going to be honest with you. There was, there was somebody who was going to run uh, last election. Had they won, and we had two candidates who were, whose social positions were the same, I, was going to have to, I wouldn't be able to vote for either one. But, you know, well, they're, they're fiscally conservative. I, I, so what? I can trust God. I can believe God financially, but I can't, change, you know, I can't endorse because of my own personal desire for financial prosperity or, or financial security in a natural realm, violate my conscience of what the Word of God teaches about life and teaches about marriage and teaches about godly things. I can't violate that just so my pocketbook will be happy. Amen. Y'all here? Gone home. I mean, I, I can't. I, that's, that's personal. I'm not endorsing or not endorsing a candidate. I guess I could. I guess I could send mine in with all the other pastors. You heard about that, didn't you? All the pastors that are preaching in their pulpits and saying and, and endorsing a candidate and then taking the tape, putting a, putting a letter to the IRS telling who they are, when they preached it, wh what their address is, and saying, come get me. Trying to get the IRS to take somebody to court and strip them of their 501c3 um, status. They want them to do it. Why? Because no, the IRS has never enforced the Johnson law. Never. Since the 60s, it's never been enforced. No one's 501c3 has been taken away. And they want to get it in the court so they can take it to the Supremes and have it ruled unconstitutional. But until there's been an actual case, they can't get it in court. So they're begging the IRS to do it. I mean, it's like walking up and slapping and saying, arrest me. Do it. Come on. 
5,000 pastors did it this year. They haven't gone and visited one of them. 2,000 last election cycle. About 500 the previous election cycle. They're doing everything they can to get the IRS to come after them, and they won't do it. They send letters saying, well, we're, 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 we're investigating you, and they never show up. So all this mess about you can't endorse? Well, anyway, that, that's the backside. All right, now we're going to stop right here because it's, 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 it's the 45 minutes of power. Because I was late. <laughs> Actually, it's about almost 50 minutes now. Yeah, I tell you, if my wife hadn't come, y'all sat out here for an hour, and I would have walked out here and gone, what's going on, guys? You're saying, we're going home. <laughs> Oh, it's now working. That's weird. You know what I bet happened? I bet the little stem got taken off. Yeah. Got pulled out. Amen. Like Brother Hagin said, and you just have a stem winder. Then you look at all the young people, they're going, oh, what? What's a stem winder? Had, had us a stem winder of a service. Well, you used to have to wind your watches up. Neat, 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 neat. Yeah. <laughs> there are days I wish you could still do that and have to go pay, have to go pay that $7 to get that battery put back in there. Amen. All right.